First of all, I would like to acknowledge the First Nations people as the original inhabitants and the traditional owners of the land that we're gathering on today. And I acknowledge all elders, past, present and emerging, and thank you for attending. Now, we're about to have a couple of cracking sessions. Now, the rules that I have is I'm supposed to clear the room between speakers, but if there's no one queuing up outside and you're quite happy sitting there having a chat, I think we'll play that by ear if everyone's all right with that um, and see how it goes. Um, and so I'm really excited. The next two speakers we've got in this room, I think, are a force not only of nature, but a force of the future. And one of the things that I've recognised amongst women in STEM particularly is that a lot of us are still considered untapped resources. When I moved from my PhD into a corporate job, I stopped doing a lot of the innovative work that I was doing, and I lost a lot of the diversity I had in my studies. So I'm really interested to hear how we're going to fix that problem, please, Jacqueline. Um, and so first of all, I'd like to um, introduce Jacqueline Tate, who's not only a superstar of STEM, but you need to follow her on Twitter as well. And uh, Jacqueline is going to be talking about fostering creativity with digital technology. Woohoo! This one on. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to, to my talk. I'm so excited to be here, as you'll see from my slides. Um, <laughs> oh, clicker. So, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I pay respect to my, their elders, past, present and emerging, and to those here today, and to the next speaker, who is awesome. Um, this is a picture from a place where I spent my childhood. Little did I know that it was the oldest example of creativity, tech creativity, older than the pyramids. So this is eel traps um, that have only just been recognised by UNESCO in the last week. So I really wanted to draw your attention to that. So this is my talk, Fostering Digital cre Creativity with Digital Technologies. So it's a story of collaboration between Coder Academy and La Trobe University, a pilot study that I'll share the results of, and a plan for the future. Here's the researchers. One of them is Catherine Lang, Associate Professor Catherine Lang. She is um, at La Trobe University, Director of Education. She's worked on women in computing and improving gender equity for the last 20 years. And she's written the book on it, multiple books, in fact. And this is me with my little robot. I'm a superstar of STEM. I was a neuroscientist back in the olden days. I spent 10 years in med tech working on the cochlear implant. And today, Catherine is at home with the gorgeous Geordie on her lap because she's hurt her leg. So she can't fly and that's why she's not here with you all today. And that's me being very excited to have you all here. <laughs> So this research is all about the questions. I'm not definitely going to answer them today, but I want to think about them and talk about them with you because you're the ones who have, who have the power to make these changes. What's this research got to do with gender and technology? Why should we focus on pre-service teachers? And pre-service teachers are undergraduate teachers for people who don't work in education faculties. Um, what is digital creativity? Can it be taught? And how will we investigate it? And then where will we go from here? <sighs> so this is the leaky pipeline. And I'm very happy to be the first person to put up a slide of the leaky pipeline, but I doubt that I will be the last. This is actually a really useful one. It comes from Sydney, from Professor Caldwell Nielsen. It starts off nice and wide. All the people, all the kids, both genders, having engagement and participation in ICT. Start off in primary school, a bit less early secondary school, get to the cliff edge of year nine where it starts to cut off. And then we come all the way down to this pinhead at the bottom, which is where all of us are right now. This is rubbish. We need to change this. And so this research is, starts off with this at the heart. This is the core of the problem. Click. So Catherine Lang, uh, Anamika Craig and colleagues have done a big review of all the outreach for um, outreach activities in ICT. They started off their 20 years of work directly looking at gender and technology. They did programs like Digital Divas, they went into schools, they set up after school clubs just for girls. Then they decided that to increase their sphere of influence, they would move up to supporting ICT teachers I'm sure there's some in the room today. And then they moved up to not just supporting ICT teachers, 
but supporting all teachers of various disciplines. And then they moved up to setting up networks between peers, between teachers. They concluded their research with this. The synergies between digital technology, initial teacher education, creativity and knowledge co-creation is the way of the future. And in Catherine's latest book chapter, which should come out in the next month so that it can have a reference, as a researcher in gender and computing for the last 20 years, I've concluded that while the intentions of those conducting intervention programs to challenge stereotypes, myself included, are needed, the outcomes are often localised and the breadth of impact is not seen in a proportional percentage of changes for women at university in computing careers. So yes, we have more women, but we also have more men studying computing. So when you look at the proportions, it's not a happy story. So what's the biggest lever for change? <laughs> Let's ask Wonder Woman. I'll be taking a poll as to whether this is an appropriate or inappropriate gift. <laughs> it's about 70-30 <laughs> so far. But this is what it is. We're looking for the biggest lever to make the biggest change. How much longer should I leave it up for? <laughs> is that enough? Yeah, yeah, All right. <laughs> All right, so those pre-service teachers that I was talking about, undergraduate teachers, initial teachers, people that have finished year 12, decided to become a teacher, someone who's a career changer, comes across. 29% of all of those teachers in high schools decide to specialise in STEM. Down there you can see the percentages of what they do out of that 29%. 3% of those finish with a computer or IT specialty. So that means only 1% of free service teachers actively select technology. So all of the primary school teachers need to mark against the digital technologies curriculum. All high school teachers will be engaging in technology whether they want to or not. <clears throat> we think pre-service teachers are a powerful lever for change. When, when teachers are in that phase of their life, they're full-time learners. They're not tied to the philosophy, the resources and the workload of their current school. They're spread across all specialties at that point. Many of them won't have chosen what they want to specialise in. And they'll go on to teach children across all ages and stages. So across this funnel-shaped bit of the leaky pipeline, where all of the participation by girls drops off. So we think that if we can make a change in this area, we, we have the potential to make a big difference. What's a digitally creative teacher? It's not a teacher who is capable in technology use. It's a teacher who has the confidence to be creative with digital technologies. This is Amelia Earhart. She's here to tell us that this is a pilot study. <laughs> so this is a small number that we've done, but we've done a lot of methodology development, so we're still going to talk about it. So the aim of this research is to graduate teachers who are competent, confident and creative with digital technologies. We'll investigate our influence on pre-service teachers' creativity through theory, active learning and reflection. The research was de designed together by us at Coder Academy and Catherine and her team at La Trobe University. La Trobe provided the research expertise, evaluation methodology and the pre-service teacher cohort. We had the outreach methodology, all the equipment and the industry expertise. Okay, this is a messy slide. I've done it on purpose because from the outside of the room, this might look like what this workshop was. It was a one day workshop that we delivered to a cohort of undergraduate teachers. They walked into the room and they got to do, um, build, a, build a light up name badge, just something to do while we chatted. Then we moved into theory. So the theory was a merry-go-round of all, um, starting from constructivism all the way up to computational thinking and systems thinking. This was to ground them in theory, to show that this was a pedagogical method, not just a fancy shiny tool, to show them that they were the, the experts in the pedagogy, the tool, the tech, that's not the expert, they're the expert. It was to create a level playing field because we had teachers coming in from all different 
specialties and backgrounds. And it was to give them strategies to be digitally creative and to talk about it. We didn't teach them that the, these models were somehow right and what they needed to do. We taught them that they were just a way to talk about digital technologies with each other, with the person who holds the budget strings in their school. And then we went into the really fun bit. So short cycle experiential learning. We had five stations uh, where they could join in small groups. They got hands on and they played. They did things like unboxing. So to teach these people that uh, this tech is for you. You can open a black box and whatever's inside, you can work it out. You can do that. You're a, you're a teacher, you can do that. So we did things like little bits, which are just electronic components that magnet together and replace some of that soldering that Lisa was talking about this morning. We've got AI robots, Cosmo, we had VR and we had Sphero. But it's not about the tech, it's about this experience, it's about this managed interaction that we had between us and the pre-service teachers. So then we collected data, which was the reflections. So we looked at their individual responses before and after the workshop, after each activity, and then we did a larger group um, discussion, which was recorded. Here's all the data that we collected. This is the boring slide. So we found, out, we looked at the demographics, their current digital technology use, whether they had any evidence of um, being digitally creative, self-reported evidence of being digitally creative. During the workshop, we asked probing questions. So we asked them things like, um, where is the learning occurring? What are you noticing? What are you hearing? What's the dynamic like in your group? How does human movement support the learning? Getting them to think about what's happening around the tech, not thinking about this shiny new toy. And then after the workshop, we talked about what kind of pedagogical knowledge they had. We talked about their self-efficacy using technologies for design and learning. And we asked them to identify their three most important learning outcomes. So here's the demographics. Here's our preliminary results. We had 21 pre-service teachers, nine doing a master's of teaching, two doing a double degree. We had nine studying the four-year teaching degree, and we had one studying a Bachelor of Early Learning. We had a pretty standard um, breakdown of gender with 17 women and four men, represented by Ada and Alan Turing, because we're here. In terms of age, it wasn't exactly as expected, so we had a relatively old cohort compared to um, the demographic at La Trobe Uni. So that's interesting when it comes to analysing the results. So pre-workshop, we asked them to self-report um, their instances of digital creativity. Have you ever animated something? Have you ever cut up a video and posted it? There's a, there was a whole list. And four people had only done one thing. And we're going to focus on them as a little case study now. So during the VR, these teachers um, got to draw with a brush and then walk inside their, their picture. They got to experience underwater and walk through a coral reef. And they got to go to the pyramids. Teachers said things. So, so these four people who had never had experience with VR before, one had a an epiphany during this. <laughs> she said, what is this? Have I walked into my dream world? Um, and that was just music to my ears. They talked about using it for learning in teams. They talked about using it in science and in history. They talked about using this technology to explore different climates. One person said, I could take my class home to where I'm from and not just tell them about it, show them. So they were thinking about using this create this digital tool across the curriculum. And we had Cosmo, our lovable robots that nobody wants to give back. <laughs> the teachers really loved this robot and students do as well. And it was interesting to hear the reflections of the teachers talking about, so the, this teacher that said to promote interaction. They were talking about um, neurodiverse students in their class who didn't want to interact with their colleagues with their colleagues, with their other kids in their class, um, but might want to interact with this robot. So that wasn't talking about using this in a STEM class or in ICT. They were thinking creatively as teachers, you know, using their expertise as teachers to look at how they can use this tool. And then we had Sphero, which is a rolling robot that 
also everyone loves to cause havoc with. Um, teachers were thinking about doing geography and directions for smallest children looking at left and right, teaching that um, using this ball. So for these four people who had very little um, digital experience with digital creativity, this is their most important learning outcomes. To create engaging environments, to familiarise myself with learning theories, that it's okay to explore and have fun, that is really good. <laughs> to have people say this is okay. It's okay to explore, to not be the expert, to not get it right. To incorporate digital technology with my methods. That coding is just steps. I wish we could teach that to everyone. <laughs> the coding is, is just steps. So coding doesn't need a computer, but a clear set of instructions. And we'll just ignore the inner loop part. <laughs> it's not perfect. Uh, and that you can use technology to do anything you want. Yes, you can teach us. <laughs> How confident did you feel following the workshop using digital technologies to support student learning? That, so 17 out of 21 people said, I feel well prepared to teach and learn in technology rich environments. And then 100% of our participants said, I now have more skills to select and use digital technologies to maximize learning outcomes for my students. I feel more comfortable to use digital technologies in teaching and learning contexts. I would like to have more workshops like this offered to me. So our preliminary conclusions based on our tiny number is that we had success of individuals. There was light bulb moments. There was lots of evidence of collaboration and creativity and the confidence to learn and fail. There was a really noticeable change to those of us in the room for those who had the least prior knowledge we had a very successful partnership model. All of the stakeholders were very satisfied. We had the participants, the researchers, us as the outreach provider, and the funding body. Very happy with this. This is a model that is ready to go. We had a successful method of delivery. So with each of these professional development workshops, anyone who run them, ran them would add to the evidence base which each, with each iteration. So this is a powerful model. Next steps, we would love to do more iterations, obviously, increase those numbers, and longitudinal studies. What happens to those teachers in their first year? What happens in their fifth year? What happens to the ones that go on to study ICT? How many teachers that um, do this workshop then go on to become an ICT teacher? We've got a huge shortage of qualified ICT teachers in our schools. So, yeah, that's, that is a very interesting research question to us. We'd like to include peer-to-peer -peer training and knowledge co-creation. So this is something I haven't spoken a lot about here. This, that, um, the research that Catherine and her colleagues have done have shown that is a very powerful model of teacher training and for pre-service teachers as well, having currently serving teachers come and be the, the leaders of the training, talking to them about real experiences. So. Um, in, we, we did a tiny bit of that in one of our workshops. We had one participant who had such a great time. We brought them on as a, as a collaborator in the next session to teach the next group of, of undergraduates. We would like to influence undergraduate curriculum. So currently, teachers in their first... So this is a Victorian experience, and I would love to hear about your experiences at your universities in your Department of Education. But um, Catherine did a study of Victorian universities, they found that teachers had one compulsory digital technology um, subject in first year, and then everything else is choice. And we know that only 1% of them chose to do digital technologies. So we would like to change that, and we would like to continue to use this research and work with, with you all to, make, to influence change there. We need more funding. We need more university partners. We need to make this big. We need to pull that lever like Wonder Woman. <laughs> we also, Catherine and I have an exciting announcement. I don't know if anyone knows of ACM, Association for Computing Machinery. That is, yeah, great. So Catherine and I went to China recently to visit um, the head of ACMW, so the Association for Computer Machinery, Women in Computing, and they're very successful in India, hugely successful in Europe, and in um, America, ACMW always partners with Hopper Celebrations. So we are 
starting ACMW Asia Pacific. And last week, I was nominated as chair of that group. So I'm going to chair that committee. <laughs> So if you would like to join us to celebrate, to support and advocate for women in com computing, come and talk to me and we'll see what we can do. Our first celebration is going to be in the Philippines. We have two members from China, a member from Indonesia, Philippines, New Zealand, Thailand, Singapore, Myanmar, probably forgetting someone. Australia, we have a couple of members. Janine, Janine from Tech Girls is there making our W sign, which means something else in Australia. So we'll skip that. <laughs> All right, let's talk. This is why I'm at this conference. I can't wait for the, the uh, girl gang session this afternoon with Celeste and Sarah. I have some amazing girl gangs. I'm a superstar of STEM. There's, there's some of us here, come and talk to us. They are such a great support to me. Coder Academy, my girl gang over there, yes. <laughs> Tech Girls are superheroes. Janine's chairing in another session, but I'm an ambassador for those guys and I love their work. Ada's Army is a new one, which I haven't got time to talk about, but come and talk to me about that later. There's lots of opportunities for us to work together. Schools, teachers, industry partners, university partners, come and talk to me. I'm here all week. We need to collaborate. We need to make change. A couple of current research questions that I have. Are we burying tech in the acronym STEM? And another one that I'm working on is how can we use tech to democratise clinical knowledge in rare cancers? And that's because I'm a neuroscientist, so that's a separate one. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, perfectly 20 on minutes time. and two seconds. Right, there's a, there's a lovely present for you from us. Right, now we do have a roving mic in the room. We've got time for maybe one or two questions. If anyone's got a burning question that they want fielded in the room, put your hand up. Let's have a look. I'm too scary. <laughs> oh, there we go. We've got one at the front. Well, as the mic's coming to you, I've got a quick one for you. So one of okay. the things I've noticed, I'm a PhD trained scientist. Only, you know, two or three percent of people with PhDs actually stay in academia. Are these people channeling into, unfortunately, like I did, into the corporate world, or are we actually seeing them going into the education space? So with your cohort, with the people that were over 25, how many of those had a postgraduate PhD or master's qualification in science subjects? None. Is None that something that you think is something we need? <sighs> Look, that's something that Catherine would be able to answer as Director mm. of Teacher Education, but not me. Um, people with PhDs are going everywhere but academia, is what I would say. Yep. <laughs> the reason why we call it permanent head damage. Yes. Um, <laughs> okay, question from the front there. Um, I'm just really curious about the are we burying tech in the acronym STEM. Mm. It's the first time I've kind of heard that put out there, but um, could you maybe shed some more light on that? Or what, so you know, what do you STEM think STEM as an acronym mm. is really common in teaching circles or I, I told someone that I worked in STEM and they asked me if I had a gardening business once so it's oh. not universally known. Um, the stats for tech are very different than for science and mathematics. It's much more dire for tech and STEM is becoming this way of communicating especially in education. They're getting a STEM teacher and what some people aren't even seeing the science, the technology, the engineering, the mathematics, it's just STEM as a bubble. Mm. Um, so what Catherine and I have spent a lot of time talking about is, is that actually good for tech being diluted in that way mm. when we, we have specific challenges and we have, um, you know, arguably um, more, more trouble attracting, especially in gender equity. So that's what we're, we're spending time thinking about. And it's, it's controversial because a lot of my jobs have STEM in the title, so, you know. <laughs> It's the point where it's STEM with two M's and then it's STEAM with two M's and it's like, should we just have the alphabet? Yeah, yeah. Um, have you heard of STREAM? Okay, very, right, well, let's keep this quick and concise. Um, lady at the front and then lady at the back and then we're done. We're eating into that 10 minute time. Um, if there's a volunteer in the room, can you just check to see if there's anyone queuing outside? Because if there isn't, then we won't bother clearing the room. Thanks. Hi. Hi, uh, it's just a quick question. Uh, on your research, was that um, optional for the in-service teachers or? It was optional. Teachers, it was optional. It was optional. So they so self-selected? <coughs> they weren't selected. So that was just advertised on their LMS. Um, the, the people who were involved in the research talked about it in their lectures, but that, so they were self-selected. And after looking at the results for the people who self-reported as having low digital creativity, there's been a lot of talk about how we select people in the future. So if you've got any insights on that, we really think that... If we're looking for that biggest lever, maybe we need to go 
for where there's the biggest change to be had. I think it needs to be compulsory as well. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Oh, hi. Oh, hi. Um, I have a question. I mean, not much question, but um, um, my research is with um, on working how um, AR and VR could be used at schools for st to students. And mm -hmm. I'm just starting, um, and I've realized there's a lot of resistance from the teachers, which I didn't expect when I started this research. Um, and now listening to you, I kind of feel like this has all become like a whole big um, problem. Yeah, <laughs> and, um, I agree. So do you think the resistance is because of what you're actually working on at the moment? So that's I something that I was really wondering that why why they don't want us to do this? These are really cool stuff. It's not well, like Amanda says, it's not compulsory to learn these things. You can go into a classroom knowing none of these things, having no experience. Many people in our workshops were very skeptical about the, the VR side of it, and we did give them some AR, but we gave them a really safe, small place to try it. So they did the headsets first, sitting in a chair, and we were very aware that this was a resistant cohort of people, so we changed accordingly. We had to kind of, kind of take it back, whereas the kids will run towards the VR and put their headset on and fight anyone off who tries to take it off them. Um, but then we had these huge changes in mindset over the day. So maybe how you introduce it, but we can talk more because getting that opposition is yeah, very common. Okay, it's 11.57 and everything at Grace Hopper down under, or sorry, I just want to say Rear Admiral Grace Hopper was how she liked to be referred to. Excellent. Uh, Hopper down under runs like clockwork. So we will start again in seven minutes time <laughs> with our next presentation. Thanks again to Jacqueline. Thank you. Okay, so let's get cooking because I want to hear what's about to be said. And I think um, as a British-born white Australian woman, to recognise the privilege that I have, despite coming from a working class background, is something that is not really told to us very much in the UK and I've experienced more and more frequently in Australia. And I guess the one thing I can say is that I try to be the best ally that I can, but every day for me is a learning curve. And I think if we can remember to engage two ears, one mouth, we get a lot further, a lot faster when it comes to talking to our sisters and what they need. So wonderful Celeste is about to um, embrace us all with some knowledge and some thoughts and some challenges around embracing our titters and getting them involved in technology. I'd like to give you a very warm welcome. Celeste, come to the stage. Yes. Hello, thank you, thank you. Is this on, can you hear me? All right, before I, like to, uh, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the um, Taurabu and the Yagara people of this um, country, the traditional owners of this country, where we meet today and pay my respects to both elders past and present, and to them, all my uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander brothers and sisters in the room today. Um, when I look forward to my future, uh, I always step forward with the knowledge that there were people before me, the old peoples. It's important to recognise and understand that within the STEM space, and as technologists in Australia and beyond, there are over 80,000 years of rich cultural history that flourished because of their ability to innovate and manage an entire continent based on their cultural, scientific and technological knowledge. It is the only reason uh, I stand here today and I can continue the sophisticated systems in my community and share those with you. Um, I'm grateful, where's this clicker? <laughs> um, what am I up to? I'm grateful to, to, to be here today and having a yarn with you at Hopper Down Under. Um, from what I've learnt, uh, Grace Hopper liked a challenge and uh, she forged a pathway for women into this space um, that in her time was not the norm. So, I believe in gender equality, which is why these spaces are necessary. Um, in my culture, time spent with only my matriarchs and sisters is a necessity. Um, we understand the strength that comes from being with each other. We focus on intergenerational learning, um, as I have a cultural responsibility to recognise those learnings and apply them to my life and to my journey and pass them down to generations to come. So I would like you to think about um, what you learn here today from some of these amazing women, um, older than you, younger than you, different cultural backgrounds, um, people you've never heard from before. Um, we all have different experiences and in this space specifically, um, those experiences and that different perspective is gold. 
Okay, so empowering TIT is in technology. Um, TIT means sister. Um, it's quite universal considering we have over 250 different language groups in this country. Um, when I say Tira, I'm talking about my First Nation sisters specifically. Um, it's a term that I reserve for my girls, um, a term of endearment, um, and it's mostly used as an adjective to explain uh, how I feel about the women in my life because Tira in my community is a sister who is resilient. Um, I will be talking about what I do. Um, what I've experienced within the STEM space, and you will get a deeper understanding of what it means to be underrepresented, um, not only as a woman, but as a First Nations black woman. So, hey. <laughs> I'm Cece. Um, I'm a Beragaba South Sea Islander woman from far north Queensland. Um, I have ancestors who come from this land and ancestors who are blackbirded here to cut sugarcane. Um, if you do not know the history of South Sea Islanders in this country, I recommend you do your own research. Um, I come from two traumatised groups of people, one whose land was stolen and um, the others who are part of a slave trade. I come from families who have inherited trauma and that trauma continues to impact on my life today. Um, so in my downtime, my side hustle, I'm a makeup artist and creative, um, but I currently work for an amazing uh, a company called Girl Geek Academy as their program producer. Um, my titter girl over here, Sarah's in the crowd. <laughs> um, you know, I come from a family of matriarchs and strong women. They say it takes a village to uh, raise a child, and in my instance, that is very much true. Um, you know, I come from a family of educators, some with the relevant qualifications and some without, nonetheless, educators in their own right. Um, Oh, same slide, sorry. Uh, my, are, my family are creatives. Um, not they would ever identify as such because it's just what they've been doing for a long time, uh, learning and teaching through creativity. And because of that, I am multifaceted. Um, I have many other loves and passions that drive a lot of what I do in this space. So my love for technology started at home. Uh, my father was a sci-fi nerd. Um, Star Trek, Stargate, Star Wars, all the stars. <laughs> So if he was watching it, that's what we were watching because we had no other choice. So it started off just from being annoying to, oh yeah, what's this? Um, you know, so I was also my mother's personal in-house um, IT officer. Um, <laughs> um, I learned from a very young age that if you just like turn something off and turn it on again, it's problem fixed. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, my mother brought home these CDs one day and they were um, digital literacy CDs and they had all these lot of, lot of deadly games on there and challenges they, um, that you could do and that was my first real introduction to digital technology and how it changed the way of, of my learning. Um, I didn't have a great time learning when I was younger. Um, I couldn't identify with the, with the way I was being taught so in my head that just meant that I was dumb. Um, but so these games that I was playing on this computer, there were so many visuals, there were so interactive, there were so many different challenges, um, and it really started to come to that realization that, hold on, I am smart, um, I just learn differently. Um, you know, so that was my first experience with tech and our home computer, and then as I got older, I was being told both directly and indirectly that uh, tech was for boys. Um, and so that's when my priorities started to change, and then sport became my passion. So uh, when I was in high school, um, you know, and that, sorry, that netball, I was, I was a netball player. Um, and I actually was living here in Brisbane a lot, playing for um, uh, Queensland and Australia. So that was pretty fun. Um, but that, as I got older um, and I went into high school, I believed that sport was the only viable uh, career option for me because that's what I was being told. Um, no one told me that there was all these other career paths out there that I had every right to pursue. Um, so, you know, I was good at it, I enjoyed it, and it just made sense. Um, so those issues about not knowing what jobs are out there and what, not knowing what career pathways you can take is still currently the issues in my community that we're facing today and that's the pathway that I'm on in, in educating and um, bringing awareness to those different jobs so that we can exist in those spaces and we can have access to them. So I've been on a bit of a roller coaster with my career and where I thought I'd be, I still don't know what, what I want to be when I grow up, um, like many of us in this room. <laughs> um, you know, but as long as it's rooted in helping my community, that's all that matters. So my passions now lie in uh, STEM education and forging pathways uh, for my mob to gain access to the space, um, you know, and supporting my titters who are already in the space and those who want to be a part of it. So, you know, I've been all over Australia. Um, as you can see some of my cool photos up here, I rode a camel in Broome one time. That was pretty mad. The one of me jumping up the top there, that's in Broome, Western Australia. Um, the one of me in the fuchsia, uh, that's me in um, Redfern at the block there. And then the one down the bottom is in Daria Hermansburg, which is in like Northern Territory. 
um, like an hour out of Alice Springs. So I've been everywhere and um, you know, I've been to a lot of um, remote communities, some with only 150 people in them at some point in time, teaching robotics, um, coding, drones and 3D printing, um, you know, and also doing that whilst connecting with culture at the same time. So you know, I, want to, I want to be real with you throughout this talk because you need to understand that the conversations I have as a First Nations woman within my community is not always conversations um, that we will have with the wider community. And it's not always, we're not always given the opportunity to voice it. Um, you know, I'm now older, I'm co more culturally strong and my self-awareness has increased tenfold. So I'm now able to see the STEM space and its limitations. I'm also learning uh, just how much power white men hold in this space and the ways in which they're deciding to use it. White men have and continue to claim this space. They promote it, market it, brand it, and ultimately they get to decide who gets to be a part of it. Um, they claimed it so they think they own it. And historically, that's something white men have been doing for hundreds of years. So just be ready to hear things you don't want to hear today. Um, I'm not here to comfort anyone. Um, I'm here to speak my truth. My ancestors chose me to deliver the truth today. So, and I've worked hard to be here and know my truth. So, Oh, that was pretty deep, eh? Um, <laughs> oh. I used to work with an amazing man called Marcus Hughes. Um, you know, he's an uncle to me, and that's, he's, he's looked after me for a very long time. And he used to say that indigenous science is a way of knowing and a way of life. The power of indigenous science lies in its ability to make connections and perceive patterns across vast cycles of space and time. Technology is not new for us. We've been inventing, investigating, experimenting, and documenting for thousands of years. This can be seen in the many technological and engineering feats that we have accomplished since time immemorial. This can be seen in objects such as the boomerang, the woomera, and the fish traps. Uh, thousands of fish traps across Australia, some still standing today. All of which have been used as inspiration for modern science and technology. Our ability to stand strong on 80,000 years of technological advancement and environmental sciences has shaped our exploration into the STEM space. And our knowledge systems showcase the sophistication, richness and leadership of Australia's first people within this space. It is in our DNA as first peoples to innovate, problem solve and invent. We are now just using different tools. In this space and within the parameters of the engagement I offer, uh, technology is just the tool, it is not the outcome. Just remember that. The main assumption is that our communities have access to technology and STEM education, and they don't. However, opportunities are not always presented to us in the way that we can identify with, or the technology and style of facilitation is not tailored for each individual community. Um, in saying that, I've never been to the same queue. I've been to so many communities here in Australia, and not one of them have been the same, ever. So, you know, we're... I'm part of a culture that is the original innovators. We're the first engineers, we're the first technologists, we're the first bakers. Um, you know, so those of us that work in the space work hard to tell stories and create our own narratives and empower our communities uh, to join us. Um, yeah. So, we just talked about this in the last one, STEM versus STEAM. I prefer STEAM. Um, I love STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Um, a lot of people argue that art shouldn't be uh, included, but for myself, art is what connects all the disciplines. You need art to be creative, to design, and to communicate. Uh, we use storytelling through art, and it's always been how we share our stories, um, how we keep knowledge systems, and how we strengthen our culture. In today's view of art and tech, you're looking at your user experience designers, your graphic designers, how engineers create concepts, um, and how you engage with your users. To exist in the space, you must have duality. Some of the greatest scientists were artists and philosophers. It is a universal language that, as technologists, translates into being interdisciplinary. So, this is also true for effective engagement. I say that I work in the tech space because that's mostly the content of what I deliver, um, but I believe the space that I mostly work in is engagement. <laughs> engagement is the key to being flexible in a workplace. Um, I find that what most people find hard is not managing your time, but people. The key to this is to communicate without ego and bias, with the intent to listen with respect and support meaningful collaboration. And that sounds a lot easier than, than done, um, right? But <laughs> 
you know, the outcome of any engagement is to inform, build awareness, and build capacity. Uh, my ability to engage is not dependent on what I'm delivering, but how I deliver it. Engagement is a skill set that comes from experience. Um, you know, it is not anything you can learn the easy way. It requires you being uh, uh, comfortable with the uncomfortable. It's an action, actively engaging. My intent to build relationships um, before I get to the KPIs. So before, before I get to any of those KPIs, it's about the people. I don't center my engagement around objectives. Um, and you will find that people, if you're doing it the right way, the people will reach the KPIs anyway. Um, and if you're doing it right, you shouldn't be needed after a certain amount of time. You know, this is especially true in the tech space because these young ones, um, you know, in terms of capability building, they learn so quickly. Um, and it's so, it's so easy to, to be able to enter, enter in and, and, and work through these things if you know what you're doing. Um, so in my experience, engagement is extremely hard. Um, it requires effort. You need to be able to build relationships based on trust in a matter of minutes, and you must be there for the right reasons, because um, it can last seconds, minutes, to a matter of days. Um, you have to be ready to give it your all to get the results, and uh, I guess in a lot of these communities, in a lot of my communities that I work in, um, you can't be there for self-serving purposes, because that's not meaningful, that's not sustainable, and we see right through it. There are two sides to the engagement coin, development and implementation both just as equally as important as the other. Development requires research, understanding the community you are working with, what do they want, not what you think they need. Understand the protocols of that community. Um, you need to engage before you engage. I'm going to say that one more time. You need to engage before you engage. Because why would they share with you if you're not sharing with them? Engage with the surroundings and the environment and do your homework. <laughs> um, you know, and then we've got the implementation, that is the physical engagement, and that's not easy either. Um, this is the part where physical interaction is required. This is where you take all that research that you just did through the developmentation side of things, and you deliver on it. Um, you know, when it comes to implementation, language is important. Um, I have to constantly adapt and tailor my presence, um, the language I use, how often I speak. Sometimes I don't speak at all. Uh, different use of language, like your tone, nonverbal communication, verbal communication. Um, you know, the communication cycle between blackfellas has been, uh, we've been mastering it and adapting it for over 80,000 years, and we've become through so many cycles of that communication and what that looks like. I could be walking down the street and see my titter across the road and peak hour traffic and have a full-on conversation without saying a word, uh, just using hand gestures, like, which way are you going? She'd say, I'm going this way. I'd say, okay, cool, see you later. You know what I mean? It can just be that simple, and I can just keep, go I can keep moving. So it's really about understanding um, the community you work in and, and, and um, really tailoring it. For instance, um, I'm from Townsville, so I'm a Birragubba girl from up Townsville way, and I'm now living in the Redfern community in Sydney. And um, that's a good example of how long it's taken me to, to really perfect that engagement in terms of development, development and implementation. That's taken me three years to successfully engage in that community. From working with their children, to then working with their parents and community members, to now being a leader on a country that's not even mine and being asked to speak. That's taken me three years to perfect. Engagement is not something that's going to happen overnight. Um, you really have to work at it. Um, so, you know, it's, it's forever evolving engagement. Um, it's dynamic. It's important. And it's always up for interpretation. You know, however, um, depending on communities and depending on the space you work in, I feel there is a right and a wrong way um, to engage. And, you know, and the question that I want to ask you for you to think about today is, you know, what is your compelling action to your commitment to engage? What does it look like? What does it feel like? This is how I engage, and this is what works for me, um, but it might not work for you in the same way, and it won't. Um, but this will give you an insight into how First Nations people engage with each other, and also, um, I guess, I'm not here to tell you um, how, what I do and so that you can go out and start working with blackfellas and working with people you never worked with before. I'm telling you this so you know how to approach those of us who do. You know, I receive many emails in a, in a week from non-Indigenous people asking me, you know, I need, we have X amount of money um, to do this good thing with it, and, um, you know, it requires the input of Indigenous people, and, um, you know, and then it finishes off with, you know, uh, let me have access to your knowledge and your networks. <laughs> and it turns out, like, Lim, can I pick your brain over a coffee? Um, if it's a lifetime of coffee, um, no. <laughs> 
that is engagement, that is a service. Um, you know, and these people are usually in very unique uh, positions where, they, where we have a chance to really have positive outcomes and tangible outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. So it's like, what that tells me is that you didn't consider to what I know to be of value and that again, we were an afterthought. Um, and which to me is a reflection of the workplace in which the space must not feel inclusive. Does that make sense? Oh shit, okay. <laughs> Okay, so our community, on my journey through different industries and uh, disciplines, um, I've learned that about the positive impact a safe work environment has on its employees. Like many, I have worked in toxic workplaces, workplaces that didn't value me, didn't value my knowledge, and didn't value my experiences as a human being. My journey through university felt the same. I just felt like I was learning how to be compliant. So, um, you know, I was in unhealthy relationships with many of my employers, which in turn started to affect my mental health. You know, and I think a safe uh, working space for First Nations women and people alike is to be able to be open to discussing mental health. Um, you know, but this I feel is actually just how mental health should be approached by everyone. Um, with sensitivity and empathy and throughout the entire process, you know, you must be patient in the way that you communicate, in the way that you listen. So deep listening, just being quiet and listening, that's all it requires sometimes. Um, so, you know, right now we are in a we're in a time of transformation. Um, we work in a space that has been advancing so rapidly and we haven't stopped and asked ourselves um, what our purpose is as part of the tech community as a collective in terms of First Nations people within this space. Um, you know, we have an amazing opportunity to design this space and, you know, come together and design our roles and design our careers together. Um, so, you know, we need to be engaging with the community that we serve and that means that our staff and our employees should reflect our community as well. It's not an overnight fix. The, the amount of time it took to implement the current system, it's going to just it's take just as long to implement a new, better system. So be prepared for the long haul. And what's my last slide? Yes, so this, I work for Gilgit Academy, as I said before. Um, it, we, it's a, been a great, amazing learning experience. They've been so supportive. It's just worked with a whole bunch of beautiful women um, who've just been so supportive of me. They've been open to having those uncomfortable conversations with me um, and just supporting me the entire time. I'm a, the only First Nations woman that, to work for Gilgit Academy, hopefully not the last. Um, you know, but what drew me, drew me to Gilgit Academy was the, um, the fact that uh, it was for women by women. They're all very supportive of the fact that I am learning as much as I can and will be taking that back to my community. Um, I have an awesome time with them and I can't wait for the future of women in tech. And I just feel like I'm thanking you so much for being here today and listening to this talk. Um, you just can be my honorary titters for today, which is great. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but thank you so much for having me. It's been a real, um, real pleasure to, to, to be able to voice my opinions and my perspective and talk on behalf of my community. So thank you. present for you. Yay. you. See me waddle up to the stage. Right, we have got a roving mic in the room. If anyone has any burning questions, I suggest you ask them now. No. Um, yes. It's funny that whole have a coffee and pick your brains thing, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's like a roll your eyes type of moment. It's, oh, I've, I've actually got to the point now where I say, oh, my engagement fee is $5,000. I'm saying that. Yeah. I say, <laughs> I'm using that. <laughs> Because the thing is, you know, the people that still want to hire you and work with you will go, okay, sure. And the ones that are just wanting to take... Yeah. It's like, thank you for not wasting any more of my precious time. Yes, yes. It's, it's a common theme. We always, in my community, the, you know, our discussions that we have, uh, we always have to give a part of ourselves under the assumption that we may never get anything back. Hmm. Does anyone want to ask a question? Hello. No, it's actually kind of based on that. I was going to say, what would you say if someone were to approach you, what would be like the ultimate way for them to communicate with you and to open a discourse about um, whatever you would like to do and what they would like to do? I'm sending them my <laughs> PayPal details. <laughs> <laughs> Five grand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, you know, I'm happy to have those conversations. It's just about... Um, that's why this talk was necessary today because not so I said before not so you can go and start working with people but so you know how to approach those of us who do um, in really sensitive ways um, because you know we need to know that our, our knowledge is valued and our sciences and technologies should be normalized because they're just important if not more important just as anyone else's. It's mm. a good question. Yeah. Hi. Hi, um, thank you, sister. That was awesome. Yeah, it was so deadly. Fancy. It was nice to hear you um, speak in that way. Um, I've been work researching in this space for years, and um, I do um, what we call indigenous tech 
um, co-design, co-development. But I look at um, UNESCO's um, approach, which is when we um, do development in developing countries or tech development in developing countries, um, we or tech transfer, sorry, in developing countries, what we do is we make sure that the skills, the expertise, instead of just um, Indigenous people handing up their expertise and non-Aboriginal people being um, experts in Aboriginal building systems for Aboriginal peoples, yeah. um, we actually make sure there's a two-way process. And I consider that Australia is a country or a continent with over 500 developing countries. So. Yeah, right. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, Are you seeing any improvement? You've been working in this field for quite a few years. Have you seen any really good examples where someone's learned something and changed the way that they then interact with yourself or community? Yes, there's, there's actually, and that's the thing, there's, there's a lot of us in this space do it, you know, doing some amazing thing with running di digital media agencies. We have a Michaela Jade um, at the conference at the moment who's oh, yeah. working with um, augmented reality. She's awesome. Yeah, um, and the thing is we're, we're all... As I said before, we're just now using different tools. We've been doing this for the longest time, and now we're just learning how to, how can we use these tool, these tools to revitalise our culture, keep our culture going strong, mm -hmm. and how can we give back and, and provide that sustainability? Because right now we're moving through a, a through a change in terms of the landscape and the land and climate change, mm -hmm. and so now we're you know because we're the protectors of this land, so it's how can we use technology? How can we use these tools to help that journey to support us on that journey? Any other questions in the room? Final one from me then. So. Yes. Girl Geek Academy, awesome. Recognise Sarah in the room as well. Um, what are your next projects? What's getting you excited? What are you going to be working on? Ooh. <laughs> Not giving away any trade secrets. <laughs> I looked at Sarah too late, can I? <laughs> we'll be yarning about that this afternoon, actually. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Next? yeah. Next? Yes, that? yes, that one. So come yeah. along, be there or be square. Um. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much. That's awesome. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Charlie. <laughs> And that concludes our session, so I think lunch will be served out um, just in that space there, so thank you so much for your time. <laughs>